Well, we are wrapping up, we are beginning to wrap up this series we've been on, this preaching series we've been on for the past couple of months called Feast on This Book. And the book we're referring to is the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, the best book to read is the Bible. And uh, we've been talking about how life-changing this book is and not because it's paper and ink and words on a page, but it in fact carries the inspired word of God to us, his people. And uh, it's been described as like a love letter from God to us. And so the title of today's message is The Map, The Light, The Sword. The Map, The Light, The Sword. And it kind of sounds like... uh, you know, the list of ingredients that you might want if you were going on a grand adventure. Hmm, what do I need to pack? I need to pack a map, a light, maybe a weapon or a knife, you know, something to, I don't know, cut down trees. Or maybe if you were going on Alone Australia, has anybody seen the show Alone Australia, where you get dumped in the middle of nowhere by yourself? And I think they're allowed to take 10 items I mean, would you take, well, you probably wouldn't need a map because you've got to, the aim of the game is last to leave, so stay there as long as you can. And uh, so maybe you wouldn't take a map, but you might take a light or you'd try and create fire pretty quickly. And uh, you'd take some kind of knife or weaponry, you know, to try and catch animals and eat and those kinds of things. It sounds like a list of ingredients for a grand adventure. But in fact, today's message is not called a map, a light, a sword. It's called the map the light, the sword, because we're going to take a deep dive into how this book, the best book to read is the B-I-B-L-E, the Bible, God's word to us is the map, the light, and the sword that we need for life's grand adventure. So you're ready to go on an adventure with me this morning? We're going to have a bit of fun. So first of all, let's talk about the map, and I don't mind maps let's not don't reveal my big picture yet boys because i want it to be like amazing (laughs) i know we've got to work on our timing here uh so the map let's set up to the story i am old enough i mean i'm coming to terms with it and just will admit it to you freely today i'm old enough to remember the days before car gps And in fact, now that I'm a part of, not very much, but I'm kind of a cheer squad for my husband who does most of the work in teaching our children to drive, um, now that we are teaching children to drive, we've learnt that there's a whole generation of young people that do not know how to get anywhere. Like, are you aware of this? They have no skills, they have no, no awareness of their surroundings because they get into these modern cars and they straight away just type in the address of where they're going and somebody speaks at them or tells them what to do at every single T and at every single corner and they never have to think for themselves. But I grew up in a time, listen to me, I sound like a really old lady now, back in my day, before... Mobile phones, yes, I don't look that old, but I am that old. And before car GPS and before the fancy new cars where you just type it into the fancy little screen, uh, we had to have what was known as a paper, yes, Lorraine knows, street directory. There it is. And when I went looking for a picture of the Gregory Street Directory. This is, I screenshotted this this week. This is from Big W Online. You can still buy them. I mean, what? Why would you, why on earth would you need a paper street directory? Unless you're trying to live off the grid maybe and uh, not have anybody know where you are. You're a conspiracy theorist perhaps. But um, so you can still buy the paper Gregory's Street Directory. Now I grew up in a small town which I think at the time I grew up there, it had maybe two sets of traffic lights in it. And then when I started year 10, my family moved to Newcastle, which was the big city. I know. And uh, that city, I mean, it's, it was a lot bigger than where we came from. Uh, that city had lots of traffic lights. And uh, so what my parents did, because they'd, got, they'd gone to uni in Sydney, like the big, big city. So they were aware of this is what you need to do when you move into a new city where you have no history, you don't know any people. How do you learn how to get anywhere? It's before the internet, guys. 
So they bought a Newcastle street directory. And we literally had to look at maps on a page to figure out where things were, where our new school was, where our new house was, where our new church was, where, we, you know, where our new piano lessons were, where our new soccer clubs were, everything. We had to figure out where it was on a paper street directory. Now, my dad can get a little bit fixated on things and he's got probably not enough to do in his very active brain. He's a very intelligent man and he put that gift to the skill of memorising maps and routes to get places that required the least number of traffic lights possible. And so as passengers in the car that my father was driving, we learnt how to get places <laughs> via all of these random back roads just so we could avoid traffic lights because that was the big mission of the day, of learning how to get places in Newcastle. Now, uh, some of my greatest adventures in life, not all of them because adventures look a whole lot of different ways, but some of my greatest adventures have involved driving to Sydney Airport. And so what I used to do back in the day, like 20 years ago, is I would memorise the road to, or the path, the map to Sydney Airport, because back in those days we did not have the GPS in the cars, but we did have emerging, it, like the internet age was emerging. So I would look up on maps.com or whatever it was called, whereis.com or something like that, I'm, like all these web URLs are coming back to me, and you would look at what, how you, where you had to go and sometimes I would print off the directions and if I was the driver, because there was no GPS to look at right there in front of you, you had to memorise how to get where you were going. Does anybody remember doing that? Am I a freak? I'm the only person. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. Nobody can relate. Then as the GPS thing started to emerge, it was, it was like such a relief, right? Because the GPS just tells you where to go. You can relax. However, what happens sometimes, and even with the new North Connects, is when you get down in the depths of the depths of that tunnel, the GPS just loses its mind. It just doesn't know where it is and it starts rerouting and recalculating. And, and, you, and so that makes me anxious. So I have still memorised which exits I need to take so that I don't end up on some roundabout back road route to the airport and miss my flight because it makes me nervous. So I still see the value in memorising the way to go and not just trusting that the GPS and that lady or man who speaks to you in your car speakers knows best. Now, God's word tells us literally that his word is a map for us. Let's have a look here in Psalm 119 at verse 105. It literally says, your word, God's word, this love letter, this book of instruction, your word is a map to guide my feet and a light for my path. This, this word, God's word, God's book of instruction is literally the roadmap for the adventure of life. But if we take my little analogy one step further, memorising God's word means that you will have it be, and be able to call it to mind. No matter which situation you are in, you'll be able to bring into your mind God's word, God's book of instruction, where to turn at the T as you go through life's grand adventure. God's word is not just to be read, it's to be absorbed into us so that it can come out of us, so that then when pressure comes, when you're in the depth of the tunnel and, you, and it's dark and you don't know which way to go, you can call to mind straight away God's word, God's truth, 
what God says about you, who God says you are, how to obey, how to live a pure and clean and righteous life. You can call that to mind no matter which situation you find yourself in because he's told us his word is a map to guide my feet. He's also told us it's a light for my path, which brings me to the light. And uh, I got up at 3.40 a.m. on Wednesday uh, to take Luke and Max to Morissette Station. I did... I fought for that. I said, rather than me drive you all the way to the airport and then drive myself all the way home, how about I get up an hour earlier and I'll drive you to Morissette and you can catch the train to the airport. You'll be right there at the terminal. It's so easy. So as usual, Rachel got her way. So I'm up at 3.40 and I'm driving the boys to Morissette Station. Now I can tell you that the road from here to Morissette Station at 3.40 on a Wednesday morning is very dark and it's very empty. And I can't remember, what's the name of the road that goes out past Elrington? Lake Road. It's especially dark because there's so many tall trees on either side of the road. So even though, you know, there's street lights and it's lit, it's very dark. And so because there's no other cars on the road for me to either follow their brake, uh, follow their backlights, whatever they're called, or see people coming because there's nobody coming, I needed more light. I needed to create more light. I needed to put my high beams on so that I could see any impending danger, namely, you know, animals that might scurry across the road at that time of the night or whatever it might be, potholes. We're living here in the beautiful city of Cessna. There's potholes everywhere and uh, I don't want to go into one. And so I needed more light because I needed it to light the way, the path for my feet. Similarly, at the moment, or it's slightly less bad since Daylight Savings finished, but just before Daylight Savings finished, uh, I do like a regular, uh, my normal alarm time is 5am. And um, so that means I leave at about quarter past five to go for my morning exercise. And uh, we live in an estate... Uh, that at the very front of the, the estate, there's a footpath, but it's tree-lined again. And so for the very first section, I don't want to blast you in the eyes, but for the very first section, I walk because the footpath is a bit unsafe. Thank you, Cessna Council. Wow, this, I, this, I did not intend this message. I'm a one-time, almost decade service um, elected councillor of Cessnock Council back in the day. So all I understand, back in my day when I served on Cessnock Council, I'll tell you this little fact, there was... <laughs> Cessnock was the local government area in New South Wales that had the largest number of kilometres of roads per capita of rate base, like rate payers. So it's a lot of roads to maintain for a very small rate base. So that's why the roads... <laughs> are the way that they are. So we love our Cessnock Council. We know they're doing the best they can to serve us. So where, why did I get... Oh, the footpath. So the footpath is a bit undulating um, and there's not... Like, you can't really see the light from the street lights in that first little section walking in front of my estate. So I would just walk rather than run. I don't start running until, if you know where I live, until I get to the nice clean footpath in front of Mount View High. That's where the running part starts. But for the first little bit before that, I just turn on my light on my phone just so that I make sure, because I'm older now, you know, I've got to be careful, got a dodgy ankle, um, just so that I don't trip over. And again, sometimes there's like little foxes and rabbits and stuff up there in the, like I know, in the nilly CBD of Cessnock. And um, just to make sure that I'm safe, because light dispels darkness, and light makes things safer. And that's why God's word is a light to guide our feet, because the map shows us which way to go. But the light makes sure that we stay safe on the path. The light is what dispels the darkness. And uh, I was so inspired by 1 Peter this week as I was reading about the light dispelling the darkness. You know, this is encouragement to us as God's people. 
It says, so get rid of all evil behaviour. Here's how we dispel the darkness in our lives, in our community, in our family, in our friendship group, in our neighbourhood, wherever it is that God's put us on the path. You know, God's given you a map for your life. And uh, today's the day to dial in and seek God about where he's leading you. What's the unique call he's put on your life? But undoubtedly, if you're in the room today or joining us online and you've said yes to Jesus in your heart, then God has got a roadmap for you and he's got a mission for you. And it involves your life being a light which dispels the darkness around you. And how does your life become the light? It's by getting rid of all evil behaviour. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy and all unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk. God's word. Feasting on God's word is the pure spiritual milk that we all need so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you've had a taste of the Lord's kindness. You are coming to Christ, who is, that's Jesus, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honour. And you, you and I, are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple on that foundation of Jesus as the cornerstone. What's more, you are his holy priests. You you are his holy priests. You are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own treasured possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. He called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbours. You know, here's that return, that, that overarching theme throughout all of Scripture that we are a set apart people. Those who've said yes to Jesus, we're called to holiness. We're called to purity. We're called to righteousness, to living God's way, to not just reading the words in this book, but letting them come to life in our hearts and putting them into action, developing holiness in us. Then even if they, your neighbours who don't believe, accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honourable behaviour and they will give honour to God. Even if your unbelieving neighbours still choose not to believe, they'll see your purity, your clean heart, your honourable behaviour and they'll give honour to God. Here's what it says in the message. You are the ones chosen by God. Honestly, I don't want any person to leave our room this morning without knowing deep down in your gut that you are chosen by God. Chosen for the high calling of priestly work chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments, the light in a dark place, to do his work and speak out for him, to tell others of the night and day difference he made for you, the darkness to light difference that he made in your life, from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. Friends, this world is not your home. So don't make yourselves cosy in it. Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. Live an exemplary life in your neighbourhood so that your actions will refute their prejudices. Then they'll be won over. They'll be won over 
to God's side and be there to join in the celebration when he arrives. I mean, isn't that the deepest cry of our hearts that the people we know who don't yet know Jesus would be won over and would be part of the celebration when he comes back? I know there's people on your heart who you, you're desperately crying out to God to be won over so they can be included in the celebration of all Jesus brings when he comes again, which brings me to the sword. You're up, Sam. I have, I mean, he's up every five seconds doing something, but he's up for this particular role right now. I've already shared with you on previous occasions about the weirdness of my childhood. So here we go. I have an actual Scottish sword in my possession. It's my uh, inheritance from my now deceased grandmother. She bought it for me while she was still alive and gave it to me while she was still alive because, and here's the weird part, if that wasn't weird enough for you, uh, because I was part of a Presbyterian church for a season of my upbringing. My parents had both grown up in the Presbyterian church. God bless the Presbyterian church. And uh, we'd been through something difficult in a church of another brand. And uh, so when that all hit the fan, my parents kind of went back home to where they felt safe and where their parents both went to church. And so here we found ourselves in the Presbyterian church for a season of our life. It was a beautiful season. Love the Presbyterians. And um, anyway, because the Presbyterians have their history in... Um, Scotland and Scottish stuff. Oh, wow, I'm really showing my lack of knowledge here. Um, and in fact, as I went and dug through the garage for this yesterday, I realised that I shamefully don't really know very much of its history. I'll put that on the to-do list. Um, but anyway, in the Presbyterian church, there was this beautiful older lady who used to be a ballet teacher. And she had a real heart for um, Highland dancing. There it is. My shameful secret is out. And so my mum, who, bless her, feels sorry for people and just used to volunteer us kids for things, whether we kind of wanted to do them or not, uh, volunteered for me as a, you know, pubescent teenager who, la the last thing I wanted to be involved in was the local Highland dancing troupe in the Presbyterian church. But that's where I found myself. And uh, so I could probably still whack out a bit of the Highland fling for you, but I, I will not be. No, no, you can forget about it. No, it's not happening. And I also learnt quiet in the peanut gallery. Um, I also learnt the sword dance. Uh, so, so people are aware of what the sword dance is, really? Okay, and, um, and so to authentic, because we practice, because you could cut your toes on that thing, because what, what it requires is that, I oh know it's a real sword, um, is that you lay the sword and the scabbard on the ground like this, in this formation, and then you do all kinds of little things in the little, in the little corners, and you do some twirling and... No, I'll break my ankle or something. Um, and so you, we would practice with little bits of wood because as you're learning, you're kicking bits everywhere and you're tripping yourself over. Uh, but my nana, God bless her, really wanted her granddaughter to have the real deal. And so I don't, like, I was even thinking about this yesterday. I don't even know how she got her hands back in those days on, like... How you, how, like there was no internet. I don't even know how the world worked before the internet. But anyway, somehow she got a sword sent to Taree, New South Wales, from somewhere in Scotland, so that I could dance the sword dance, which I of course loved. So why am I telling you that? Because God's word is also a sword, and uh, in fact. You know, some of you will be very familiar with this passage, but uh, God gives us in his word the analogy of armour. And uh, while he's called us to a holy and pure and righteous life, that's not something we can achieve on our own. You know, we can't just in our 
uh, our strong will and our stubbornness and our, our striving and even, even a good heart, a well-motivated heart, we can't achieve holiness. We can't achieve purity and we can't achieve righteousness. And so how do we bring... It's fine. Nobody's going to get hurt. I'm putting it down right now. How, how do we bring light to dispel the darkness in our world. Well, God has likened it to putting armour on ourselves. It says in Ephesians 6, a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armour so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. We're not. We don't need a physical sword. You know, I'm very mindful of the fact that in the past week, you know, knives, knife weaponry has been used for the purpose of evil in our world and even in our country, very close to home, rather than to dispel the darkness, which is why God is not asking us in a post-Jesus generation to pick up a sword and go and fight for him. He's asking us to be armed with His Word and His Spirit to empower us to dispel darkness with our lives. Because we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in all the heavenly places. So therefore... Put on every piece of God's armour so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth. We know the truth. God's told us the truth. Let's arm ourselves by wearing the belt of truth and the body armour of God's righteousness. He's, He's shown us what righteousness is. It's all in here. He's shown us what righteousness is. He's asked us to obey. For shoes, put on peace. And not just any peace, but the peace that passes understanding. The world can't understand the peace that we walk in because we know the good news about King Jesus coming to the world to save us and to set us free from all our bondages, set us free from the worry about what people will think, set us free from our addictions, set us free from brokenness, set us free from the, the knowing that some things will not be healed maybe in this world, but there is an eternal life to come where all will be made well and where every knee will bow to the authority and every tongue will confess the authority of King Jesus. That day is coming and so I put on my shoes and I walk with peace, carrying peace into my day, not going into battle with my words, with those who don't know Jesus, not going into battle with swords and knives, with people who don't think the same way that I think, but walking in the peace that comes from knowing I'm saved, set free, healed, delivered, have a home prepared for me in heaven for all eternity. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit. That's where we pray that ancient prayer of the church. Come, Holy Spirit. Bring this, these words, ink on a page to life in me. Use my life, this weak and fragile vessel to bring light into a dark place as I follow obediently the roadmap for my life you've placed before me. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers. Stay alert. He's given us everything that we need And my encouragement to us today 
is to use. Not, let's not just read this book. Let's not just even be doers of the word. Let's invite God's spirit to bring life to our bones, breathe life into our life's great adventure and journey. And then if you take another moment to close your eyes, I just want to give one more opportunity for anybody in our gathering here today, perhaps joining online or watching back later, who hasn't yet yielded to the authority of that name Jesus in their life who doesn't yet know what it is to walk with those shoes of peace on our feet, who hasn't yet learnt to put on the protection of your mind, salvation. Salvation, God's Word tells us, is only found by believing that Jesus came, that He's God incarnate, He's God as human, that He died on a cross and rose again three days later, thereby eliminating darkness once and for all. If you've not received that gift of salvation and you would like to today, today's your day, you're ready then I'd simply ask you to raise your hand right now. It's just a physical act that shows I'm ready for today to be my day. It's, it's a new day for me. It's the beginning of the rest of my life. From today, I want to be protected. I want to be carrying that full armour of God so that I can be on the right path. I'm going to yield to God's map for my life. I'm going to trust Him. I'm going to read the word as the light for that path and I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit through my prayer that I'm about to pray now to equip me for everything I need for my life to dispel the darkness. If that's you, why don't you raise your hand right now and together as a whole community, we're going to pray a prayer which will just cover all of those all of those things. Invite Jesus as our Saviour. Invite the Holy Spirit to empower us. Church, let's pray. Jesus, this is my decision. Today I say yes to you. You died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. I invite you to be my Saviour. Come into my life. Forgive my sin and fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit.